Thank you, Dr. Crawford, for the opportunity. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing you in Puerto Rico, and uh, I thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Kambi's Taj Karimi. I'm a urologist in uh, Frederick, Maryland. I trained at George Washington University, and my uh, strong interest is in neurourology and the treatment of sexual dysfunction by uh, utilizing nervous system. Uh, I'm currently a senior investigator at Johns Hopkins University, Tulane University, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, as well as uh, uh, involved in research at the Miami Project for uh, aiding uh, men with spinal cord injury with infertility issues. Um, the, the field of uh, erectile dysfunction has undergone a revolution since the advent of Viagra and the PDE-5s. However, a lot of the research has been focused on one aspect of the, what erection is. Erection is, component, is composed of three key components that is agreed upon by neuroscientists, neurophysiologists, urologists, psychologists, many other fields. Remember, field of sexual medicine is, a, is not just owned by urologists. And, there's a wealth of information in the field of neurophysiology on what erection is. Erection is composed of three factors, nerves, blood flow, and pelvic muscle strength that create venous occlusion. We have, unfortunately, in the field of urology, focused mostly on the blood flow uh, and kind of ignored the nerves, the role that the nerves uh, and the nerve stimulation play in the, in the physiology of sexual response, and also what pelvic floor muscles do for improving rigidity of erection. So, you know, the, none of these drugs really affect pelvic floor muscle strength. Um, 
as as you mentioned, uh, ED treatment options include education. Obviously, there's a strong interest in weight loss, uh, you know, loss of uh, uh, increased exercise, uh, oral agents, devices such as vacuum constriction devices that are commonly used in post-prostatectomy rehabilitation, as well as uh, intracavernosal injections and, uh, and intraurethral medications. And then for men who have more severe ED, you got the penile implants and other options. But one thing that we forget is vast majority of men suffering from erectile dysfunction or, or unsatisfying erection ability are in the mild to moderate phase where they're decades away from using vacuum pumps or injections or choosing implants. A lot of them are using PDE-5s. As you know, PDE-5s are now almost $38 a, a pill, and they are not a ideal option except for that one situation where they have one episode of sexual activity. It is not considered a corrective therapy. Especially after radical prostatectomy, uh, we, um, we still are having problems um, ob obtaining outstanding erectile return of erectile function after prostatectomy, despite, despite excellent research uh, by Dr. Patrick Walsh and obtaining nerve sparing technique, we still are not able to fully return vast majority of men to a successful sexual activity and spontaneous erections uh, down, the, down the road. A recent paper from Denmark showed that only 5% of men after prostatectomy are really happy with their erections, which is, goes against all the high rates of erections that are reported by numerous universities. Why is that? Well, we, are, we know that patients after prostatectomy are told to use vacuum pumps and PDE5s and injections. Is this the right choice? The problem is non-compliance. Once you give the pills to the patient, samples, vast majority of them do not continue it. They can't afford it or they cannot inject every day. I talk to patients almost every week across the globe telling me that, Doc, I can't inject anymore into my penis. My penis looks like a you know dartboard and I cannot do anything anymore. I can't use the pump anymore. And what happens is a lot of these patients become very disappointed depressed, they are not happy with what the progress is, and they eventually give up. The problem is when you give up, you have already started a cascade of events that cause uh, hypoxia of the penis, destruction of the smooth muscles, and then you have the problem of veno-occlusive dysfunction, which is what happens in vast majority of the patients, even when the nerves come back. Current therapies uh, that are uh, multiple uh, abstracts at the last year's AUH talk about uh, uh, very, very novel pharmacotherapy, growth factor therapy, gene therapy, stem and cell-based therapies, nerve stimulation therapies. All of all, what we are trying to do is to facilitate better erectile response or revitalize erectile tissues after injury or disease, such as post-prostatectomy, erectile dysfunction, diabetes, hypertension, uh, trauma, other factors. Well, as I went back to my first slide, the three key components of erection are nerves, blood flow, and muscles. We are only stuck in the jungle of blood flow. Unfortunately, we are constantly talking about what can we do to change the flow of blood into the penis. When we have forgotten the fact that we have to step out of the forest and look at the entire uh, uh, perspective of what is an erection. The erection is controlled by spinal autonomic centers, the activity of which is dependent on input from supraspinal centers and genitalia. Basically, it's a reflex. This is a fancy sentence. What does that mean? You look at a woman, you touch a woman, you hear a voice of a woman, or you touch uh, the, the penis, the, the, the areas in the spinal cord. 
called uh, the, uh, the intermediate lateral nucleus of the spinal cord. They receive all this input and they send nitric oxide to the penis to increase blood flow. What can we do in the field of urology to take this into account that erection is a nerve generated event? It's a culmination of multiple successful nerve reflexes that initiate a vascular event. And this is the part of my research has been, and I have been um, probably the loudest voice in the field of urology in the past five years in, in the world, telling everybody to do research on this. And we are starting to really gain so much interest across the globe, including the best of the best centers of excellence in the United States to do research. And I will uh, be happy to present with you some of the preliminary data that are coming out. Going back to the slide of what is erection recovery? Multiple studies show that men who are told to just pump and pump and pump and inject and take the pills, they do not recover as fast as patients who have a very, very happy wife, very compliant wife who is going to be sexually uh, involved in their care, motivated people, uh, spousal support, and willingness to take advantage of natural pro-erection pathways, such as people who stimulate the penis, they masturbate on a regular basis, after prostatectomy. These have shown in multiple studies to be beneficial as well. So erection recovery is a dynamic process. You need to involve everything. And I'm, one of the key points I like to discuss, in my opinion, is prostate cancer diagnosis in a person is almost like being told a traumatic event. It, there is an element of depression, element of potentially PTSD, where I believe there is a central component to keeping the patient from enhancing uh, and obtaining spontaneous erections. Now, another component of re erection is you have to be rigid. Rigidity of erection is a combination of neurovascular cavernosal reactivity, venous occlusion, and rhythmic perineal muscle contraction. Rhythmic perineal muscle contractions is what con what extrinsically um, compresses the tunica albuginea to uh, to prevent the blood from leaving the veins that are underneath the tunica, and these are all published. However, we seem to have forgotten this in the field of urology to tell our patients that you have to really do everything: blood, nerve, and muscles. As you can see in the picture of, uh, of Gray's Anatomy published about 100 years ago, the amazing placement of the ischio cavernosus muscle and the bulbospongiosus muscle in this picture. Just imagine what happens when this muscle contracts. Well, the studies have shown that 30% contraction of these two muscles increases intracorporal pressure by 200%. The female anatomy, neuroanatomy, and the, and the male uh, pelvic neuroanatomy are almost identical. The clitoris is considered the central epicenter of, of, of receptors for receiving information about sexual response from the pudendal nerve. The male glans penis is identical. The glans penis is the pentagon of erection. It contains millions of sensory nerve terminations, including pacineal corpuscles, which are vibratory sensitive. They coalesce and they leave the bottom of the penis to become the perineal branch of the pudendal nerve and the top of the penis to, to become the dorsal nerve of the penis. Multiple studies have shown that these two nerves are completely different one is motor and sensory, one is sensory. In order to obtain successful sexual response, you need to stimulate both branches at the same time. And these have been published in spinal cord injury literature, including circumcision blockage literature. 
rat studies and cat studies have also shown that if you desensitize the glands of the, these animals, you impair erection ability and successful intromission. Now, pudendal nerve is considered the king of pelvis. It is the nerve of the entire pelvis for sensation, for muscles, including the, the, the sphincters of urinary sphincter, anal sphincter, including the rigidity muscles that I mentioned. And it's also nitric oxide synthase positive. When I tell doctors, including sexual medicine experts that are well published that pudendal nerve is nitric oxide synthase positive, they think I'm crazy. But when they go look at it, they realize that it is nitric oxide synthase positive, which is, makes it an autonomic nerve. In fact, pudendal nerve receives erection signals from the cavernous nerve to supply the, the half of the penis, including the glands penis. Therefore, it, is intricately, it has intri very, very intricate connections with the cavernous nerve. And when I tell that to the doctors again, they think I'm crazy. After radical prostatectomy, cavernous nerve, which is the nerve that is only a highway for the spinal cord to reach the penis, it goes, it, it goes that it, 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 due to the damage, it undergoes neuropraxia, which is, means that it doesn't function at all. Because cavernous nerve is right touching the prostate. However, the pudendal nerve is preserved after prostatectomy because it's not around the, the prostate. It's behind the levator ani muscle. In fact, after prostatectomy, immediately after prostatectomy, the only reliable form of communication between the penis and the central nervous system becomes the pudendal nerve, which is already the king of the pelvis. As I mentioned already, the rigidity of erection is also fully dependent on the pudendal nerve. And these have been published by Tom Liu, and it is already established that during the rigidity phase of erection, it is necessary for the rhythmic contraction of the pudendal nerve innervated perineal muscles to, to create hypertension within the, process, within the penis. Because even if you open up the channels after Viagra, the penis fills, the, uh, fills with blood, but in, it reaches uh, systolic blood pressure. In order for rigidity to occur, the blood pressure inside of the corpora must reach more than 230 millimeters of mercury. And this is not the energy to produce this type of pressure has to come from another source. And the data uh, already published in several uh, very, very intricate hemodynamic studies show that pudendal nerve innovation and contraction of the repair neon muscles is responsible. And this is why as we age, we lose our rigidity. When we're young, we immediately get rigid, but when we're older, we get the blood flow, but we can't get as rigid. And the reason is that these muscles are getting weaker and weaker as we age, just like our other skeletal muscles. There's a very interesting study from Brazil that showed that in 52 patients randomized to active pelvic floor therapy versus control after prostatectomy, 47% versus 12.5% regain their potency at one year. Although there are problems with this study, the, there is no doubt that pelvic floor therapy was a very important factor in those numbers. Pudental nerves and cavernous nerves are also interconnected, as I mentioned. And this is an incredible fact that was published and studied by Dr. Baskin from UCSF several years ago, that pudendal nerve and cavernous nerve are so connected in the penis, in the pelvic complex, and everywhere, and actually branches of the pudendal nerve penetrate the tunica to enter the corpora to communicate with cavernous nerves. And none of these are being utilized by us right now. Another amazing fact, when I published a paper with Dr. Burnett looking at 30, uh, more than three decades of neurophysiology research, 
which which is basically ignored by most of us urologists is that pudendal nerve goes back to evolution because it's a nerve of sex and well-being and procreation it's connected to areas of the brain directly such as the hypothalamus which is responsible for the four f's the fear fight feeding and frustration the thalamus which is involved in orgasm and also intricately involved in ejaculation which well, we all know uh, is beneficial after stimulation also one area that i found incredibly important is that it is directly connected to the medial amygdala of the brain which is a very hot uh, area in men who are depressed pt uh, who have post traumatic stress disorder and and suicidal currently the Department of Veteran Affairs spends millions of dollars to try to calm down the medial amygdala, either with drugs or several clinical trials that I will tell you in a few minutes. The hyperactive amygdala is a known as a risk factor for patients with PTSD. Currently, more veterans commit suicide than they're killed in the field. And most of these men also suffer from profound sexual dysfunction. When they come home to the United States, what we do is we treat them with more SSRIs and more antidepressant uh, medication, which increases their sexual dysfunction even more. The right amygdala is considered an epicenter of PTSD. It modulates motivation and mood. Imaging studies of men from combat-related PTSD show hyperactive amygdala, as I mentioned. They have poor motivation, sexual difficulties, erectile dysfunction, and suicide. A study by USC showed that 48% of veterans, young veterans, with ED have psychogenic ED, as you mentioned already, uh, Dr. Crawford. The inability to deactivate amygdala may negatively impact the supraspinal contribution to erection and pleasure. Do, and the question that I ask and I want um, academic centers to begin looking into is, do men suffering from prostate cancer and its subsequent treatment have PTSD-like hyperactive amygdala? We don't know the answer to this. Pudendal nerve stimulation has shown in studies, three studies, brain, brain studies of imaging studies, that it deactivates amygdala immediately upon stimulation in several studies. Can persistent pudendal nerve stimulation calm down the amygdala and offer clinical benefit for treatment of PTSD and psychogenic ED at the same time? That is, remains to be answered. However, we receive hundreds of testimonials from patients who use the Vibrect who are veterans because the Vibrect is covered by the VA and they report improved mood and treatment of ED at the same time. Pudendal nerves and evolutionary benefit of stimulation to improve mood and sexual vigor to pass the offspring. This is a concept that I believe is obviously Back in the old, in the millions of years ago, animals who had more sexual activity were more likely to be more improved mood, happier, and likely to pass off their offsprings. And I suspect, from evolutionary standpoint, pudendal nerve. That is why pudendal nerve is so connected with these areas of the brain. There are currently millions of dollars being spent on research on PTSD and neuromodulation, such as vagal nerve stimulation, deep brain, brain stimulation, trigeminal nerve stimulation, acupuncture. And the, what they're trying to do is to see if these stimulations can replace bad memories within the areas of the brain, or it can create new, happier memories that will extinct the fear uh, memories in these brains. What we're proposing is, does a such a direct connection between the pudendal nerve and those areas offer additional benefit because it's sensory, it's simple, it is painless, it is non-invasive. 
Pudendal nerve stimulation increases oxytocin production in rats. This is another ama amazing fact that was has been studied is, as we know, oxytocin is a very hot topic currently because FDA is studying intranasal oxytocin. They have pulled it off the market and they're restudying it right now. It has clinical applications for autism, for fear response, especially in the militaries of the world who want their soldiers not to fear anyone when they are attacked, role in treatment of uh, social anxiety, reduce brain patterns of schizophrenia, and main descending neuro... And we know already that oxytocin is the descending neurotransmitter that makes erection. It's the descending neurotransmitter from the brain to tell the spinal cord sexual centers to release nitric oxide. Without oxytocin, in, uh, no central mediated erections occur. From our medical school, we all, we're all told that during the cervical opening during childbirth, immediately oxytocin is released and uh, the breasts begin to uh, fill with milk. And this is exactly what's happening. Cervix is, is obviously pudendal nerve. So pudendal nerve stimulation during childbirth releases oxytocin. One of the most interesting facts about use of vibratory stimulation comes from the use of vibrators in men with spinal cord injury. There are more than two decades of research on the benefits of using vibrators for infertility purposes in men who cannot ejaculate after spinal cord injury. However, many of these studies found unanticipated and additional benefits, such as these, these spinal cord injury patients were getting erection, they were getting relief of lower extremity contractions. Imagine that you stimulate the penis and the lower extremity contractions are released. You have increased bladder capacity by relaxation of the detrusor muscle, reduced detrusor contractions, increased urinary sphincter control, and increased fecal control. There are several studies that are published and that are, that, that, uh, that are available. What they found was that in order to get these benefits, you can't use a regular vibrator with low frequency. It has to be high amplitude and high frequency. And the vibrator shown in this slide is a fantastic device called the Ferticare, made in Denmark. Uh, Reflexonic is a US-based company that developed the Vibrect. Vibrect is a, the first FDA-cleared medical vibrator for treatment of erectile dysfunction. The difference between the Vibrect and the Ferticare is that it stimulates both sides of the penis at the same time to activate more of the sexual reflexes. The other difference, it uses soft pads that are more pleasant than a hard pad used by Ferticare, which is painful experience in men with, without spinal cord injury. The FDA has cleared the Vibrect for treatment of erectile dysfunction and also for treatment of spinal cord injury ejaculatory dysfunction. It is also approved for over-the-counter use as of October 2014 because of thousands that have been sold and there were no complaints or recalls. It is currently approved in more than 70 countries including United States, European Union, Health Canada, Australia, Turkey, India, Israel, and many other countries. A bench study that was performed at Johns Hopkins wanted to answer this question. Does vibrators even provoke erection? And they studied five healthy men who used the Vibrect in the clinic. And out of the five, four obtained uh, penetratable erections. One uh, had ejaculation prior to obtaining erection. The safety and efficacy of the Vibrect was also studied in men with spinal cord injuries in which showed 23 out of the 30 patients using the Vibrect X3, which is a higher amplitude version of the Vibrect, were able to obtain uh, ejaculatory response. These men were men with 
uh, injury above T10 and above. A, a Tulane University wanted to compare Vibrect with intracavernosal injections in the clinic. Does Vibrect provoke erection and can, can compare with injectables? And they studied it with, uh, with uh, uh, penile ultrasound and also, uh, 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 I believe, Rigi scan. 105 patients were used. And the sexual response, the rigidity scale were comparable between the Vibrect and intracavernosal injection. In addition, one of their conclusion was because injections were done after Vibrect, several minutes after Vibrect stimulation, they believed that the injection response was actually augmented by vibratory stimulation, which has already been published uh, in uh, University of Ontario that use of vibrators and injections is better than injection alone in 100, 157 patients. Does Vibrect or vibratory stimulation affect return of sexual function after radical prostatectomy? A, a study of randomized prospective trial used the Ferticare for only six weeks after prostatectomy in um, 30 patients. They used it for only th uh, 10 second bursts, which is one of the problems with this study. And they used the fair to care. What they found out that even in this, only the six weeks after prostatectomy, uh, 16 out of the 30 patients in the PVS group uh, versus only 12 out of the 38 patients who had a IIEF score more than 18. Although the P value was not uh, allowing a uh, making a conclusion about this however it did show uh, a completely uh, 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 improved in IIEF scores the problem with this study was it was only short term only six weeks and it, it did not involve sexual setting it was mostly a mechanical stimulation what is an ideal erectile aid an ideal erectile aid, I believe, for our future, is not just pills or pumps. It has to be safe. It has to be physiologic. It has to be painless. It potentially needs to be corrective to allow the men to return to spontaneous erections. It has to be pleasurable. If you have to go through pain to get a pleasurable experience, it won't work and it pr has to produce rigid erection, and it should not have systemic side effects. Current clinical applications of penile vibratory stimulation and pelvic floor therapy, uh, which is a program that we have created uh, that will be prominently uh, presented at the American Urological Association is what is called the Erection Recovery Program, which is combining Vibrect and a product called the Private Gym which is a very structured, video-based Kegel exercise program for men. So they don't have to guess how to do the Kegels. The program helps them just follow it for 10 minutes, three times a week. We believe that a combined program of stimulation and pelvic floor muscle exercise will help patients with mild to moderate ED head to head with PTSD. And what, what we're looking for is to do a head-to-head -head randomized trial in the near future. Does vibratory stimulation and pelvic floor structured exercise help men after prostate cancer treatment? Our preliminary results are very positive. Currently, there is a large randomized trial at the University of Texas in Houston and MD Anderson Cancer Center answering this question. And we're hoping to have preliminary data by perhaps the 2017 AUA. We already know that combining injection therapy and vibratory therapy can potentially increase response and reduce effective dose and pain. And obviously, vibrators are very successful in treatment of retarded orgasm and ejaculation disorders. And these have been already published by Dr. Mal Hall for patients with retarded orgasm. 
current research, as I mentioned, is we're very excited by the interest we're getting from the top of the top, you know, academic centers is what does vibratory stimulation enhance recovery of sexual function and urinary, inco urinary control after prostatectomy, which is basically pudendal nerve stimulation. Does clinical application of pudendal nerve with PTSD, we're currently in discussions to get a VA study uh, set up uh, as Vibrect is fully covered by the Veteran Administration. There's currently studies at Miami Project, again, for Vibrect X3 and ejaculatory dysfunction, and also several centers using the Vibrect in, in, in prepubescent pre boys who are immediately diagnosed with leukemia, and they want to start them on massive chemotherapy, and they want to obtain their sperm for, for sperm bank. And also the role of erection recovery program. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was uh, probably one of the uh, more informative, if not one of the most informative talks I have uh, heard on uh, this subject in a long time. And uh, you uh, generated a lot of new information. I'm, I'm just thinking about the things you covered here, like pre and post radical prostatectomy and all the nerves and and uh, you know things like post-traumatic stress syndrome, childbirth, OAB, detrusor sphincter dysinertia, incontinence. Absolutely amazing. Um, so I, I just want to you know cover a couple broad topics with you. Um, and, and and one is, um, is that, what are your thoughts? I mean, a lot of people are talking about doing Kegel exercises and other things prior to surgery. Is there any rationale to using the Vibarec, uh prior to surgery or this program uh, to hasten recovery of erectile function? Uh, 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 currently, at, in my uh, in my clinic practice, after a patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, we usually delay treatment for six to eight weeks, and we tell them to use the Vibarec, uh along with their wives and have as much sex as possible. We tell them to use the Vibrec daily and also do uh, very intense pelvic floor exercise programs to strengthen the muscles. So when they're hit with the surgery, they will not, they will have stronger muscles and more nerve response. And also psychologically, they should know what Vibrec feels like before the nerves are damaged. So they can mentally try to, to envision, re return to that kind of, psychological setting and i strongly believe that that ptsd and depression will play a strong role in in um, in prostate cancer patients let me ask you another question um you know there there was a trend for a while to use uh, pd5 inhibitors post, post prostatectomy to hasten recovery of erections up to a year uh, I, you know, I always thought that the, you know, the studies weren't large, randomized, and uh, it was somewhat iffy whether it really did do anything. Um, and then you also brought up the cost of these drugs uh, get to be uh, quite, uh, you know, out of pocket expenses for some of these patients. So, um, what are your, what are your thoughts about PD5 inhibitors after radical prostatectomy? Um, and um, and, and then going forward, also, I want to talk to you a little bit about venous leaks, if you might talk about that, too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I believe PD-5s uh, do play a role in maintaining endothelial health. That has already been published. However, in a clinical setting, if you don't have nitric oxide at the end plates of the nerves, the, there's nothing to keep by the Viagra or Cialis. That is why you need to have very intense stimulation to bring nitric oxide. And what is nitric oxide? You have no, no NNOS and you have ENOS. The nerves deliver the, the first batch of nitric oxide for the end plate to the blood flow to open up. And then you have the endothelial cells releasing nitric oxide due to the sheer force through the vessels. If you don't have any activity in the penis, at that time, there's no Viagra won't work. But I do promote Viagra, Cialis, 
uh, perhaps three times a week at high dose, 30 minutes before vibratory stimulation, because I believe that it, they, they, they work hand in hand. But you're absolutely right. They're too expensive. As far as venous leakage, absolutely, I believe that a strong component of venous leakage is pelvic floor weakness and lack of ability to contract muscles to stabilize the tunica during the rigidity phase of erection. Okay. And there's there's a, so much focus on the pelvic floor musculature right now, um, and you know relationships to a lot of things that we deal with, including prostatitis even. And there's a, with this uh, disease in it, any known as diaphragmatic pelvic spastica and and many other things like that. Um, do, do you think this uh, the vibrect and the, the that play an important role in uh, in sort of educating the public musculature and also fecal incontinence too. Exactly. The the bulbo cavernosus reflex is a reflex of stimulating the head of the penis allows contraction of the pelvic floor muscles, which is a very strong reflex, which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, present in more than eighty percent of of men. However. Pelvic floor therapy uh, uh, has shown in uh, prostatitis studies as well as well as patients with pelvic floor painful uh, pain painful bladder syndrome and pel and painful pelvic syndrome to be beneficial, and this is actually part of the AUA guidelines. But you know, Dr. Crawford, you know, in probably in Denver or any town, even even Washington, D.C., there's not even one male physical therapist, not one. We cannot find a male physical therapist, a physical therapist that will treat men, all treat women. So the problem is that most men don't, don't are not doing the proper pelvic floor therapy. That is why we believe that a structured pelvic floor therapy will be beneficial in in these patients. Yeah, we, I mean, we sort of routinely tell people to do Kegel exercises after radical prostatectomy, and even that's somewhat questionable about the value of that. Um, we started preoperatively and, and postoperatively, and then we did them for uh, biofeedback and other things like this. Perfect. So this, in a way, is sort of a a, uh, a, a way to, to institute biofeedback and some of that, right? I believe I believe that uh, pudendal nerve stimulation. Uh, in the privacy of the home, along with pelvic floor exercises, they play a a a, a, a additional role. They they complement each other. Anything that would strengthen the pelvic floor and to stimulate the nerves uh, to to uh, to co co potentially communicate and optimize nerve rea nerve activity in the pelvis, I believe is beneficial. However, the most uh, studies are needed to really authenticate this, uh, these concepts. So some of, you know, some of the, the skeptics would say uh, that uh, this, is, this is just uh, no more than a fancy vibrator. You can talk about uh, the, uh, you know, about the paddles and, and so forth in this, but it, it you know, it's nothing but a more, it's a fancy vibrator. So I, I know you talked about that, but why don't you just say another word or two about it? Well, most vibrators that you buy from pharmacies, they're page motors. They are basically buzz. They're buzz motors. They are very low frequency. We have used over-the-counter vibrators in our studies. And they do not generate the, the the reflexes that are necessary. In order for the vi vibratory stimulation to be beneficial, you need to have high frequency and high amplitude. Another problem is it is extremely difficult for a urologist to tell a patient to buy a $23 vibrator that may have uh, electrical short circuit and has burns the burns and damages the penis and potentially can cause complications because it's not designed for penile stimulation. Vibrect has been vigorously studied by the FDA, by the European Union. And all the plastic components, all the um, electric components have been vigorously tested in laboratories. Uh, the, the, the plastic that touches the surface of the penis is uh, compliant for cytotoxicity 
uh, allergic reaction. It is the highest quality uh, food, uh, poly, um, 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 uh, polyurethane. So the Vibrect is the medical vibrator. It is scientific instrument. The, the, the frequency and amplitude are scientifically designed to activate those receptors on the surface of the penis. The regular vibrators, unfortunately, do not generate those responses. However, if um, they are fun to use, and there is a large study of um, a telephone study of more than 3,000 patients done by Case Western University several years ago showed that you know, 55% of women from 18 to 65 use vibrators on a regular basis. And 10% of men use them on a regular basis. So this really? is not an uncommon thing. Well, I, I think that one thing is, that speaks for um, the device is that, you know, you do have FDA approval and you've got approval in, 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 in 70 some countries. So uh, that's, that's not an easy task. I, I think the other thing people are going to wonder is, you know, I know that uh, you said the VA covers this. Uh, and maybe another time we ought to have a, uh, Euro Today interview with you and talk about veterans and this post-traumatic stress syndrome and that a little bit more. I think that, that's absolutely huge. I have it myself having been on the staff of the VA for many decades and dealing with this problem. It's, uh, it's uh, a way out. Uh, but what I, the achiever, I, I do want to know um, about, uh, if, you know, Medicare no longer covers our vacuum devices and other things. Um, so what what is the what is the relative cost of this and and you know is there any money back guarantee or anything else that you that, that company uh, that you deal with uh, uh, does with this? Yes, uh, the the Vibrect is the cost is three hundred dollars, which is a one time cost. The device is built to last for everyday use for at least three to five years with the same battery. Once the battery is replaced, it can last indefinitely. Um, it, is, uh, it is not covered currently outside of the VA. Uh, we are trying to get the Vibrec to be approved through insurance companies. However, as you know, most insurance companies don't cover sexual, sexual devices anymore. As far as the money back warranty, we have a 30 day money back warranty. Uh, we, out of every hundred devices that we sell, we get about one to two back. Just to tell you that you know that patient satisfaction is very high. However, uh, this is an investment. You know, thirty-eight dollars for a Viagra pill adds up to more than three thousand dollars a year on a person who wants to, you know, use it on a regular basis, especially after prostatectomy. And also, the vacuum pumps are now between three hundred to five hundred dollars, and injections can cost, you know, thousands of dollars. Right. And I, yeah, I sort of heard heard you say that that this uh, the, there's a sort of a tandem effect by using both things together sometimes. Uh, so that that some of your patients still will be on uh, PD five inhibitors. It sounds like right. Yes, I mean we still for the post prostatectomy, I think we don't we don't discourage use of PD fives because the the endothelial um, you know additional endothelial help may may enhance. Uh, so we are not telling patients because there's no data saying to stop it right now. There's a lot of data saying that it may not really do much, but it doesn't say it's not beneficial. So yeah. In, in, Currently, the, the protocol at MD Anderson says Vibrect uh, uh, device by itself, and if they want to use PDE5s, they need to report it and write it down carefully w when and, and how they took it. But the, it, it doesn't, the, the protocol at, John, at MD Anderson and Johns Hopkins are not necessarily saying that you must take PDE5s. Yeah. Well, uh, I must say that uh, was a, an extremely educational um, uh, presentation, Ash, and um, I, I know that uh, all our listeners really do appreciate it. Um, new insights in this whole thing about uh, penile physiology, erections, and uh, nervous interventions, and things that I, you know, I, I quite honestly didn't understand before, and why something like this might work, and how it can uh, sort of uh, 
brought them into a whole bunch of other areas in, in men's health and, and so forth. Uh, so I, I really do want to thank you for for your time and, and for answering these questions. And I'm sure if we had listeners on the line, they'd be asking a lot of questions too. And, and maybe as we hear those, we can uh, get you back on and uh, do sort of an update and talk about uh, some of the other applications of this. So, again, I, I, I on, on behalf of uh, the urologists and everybody listening to this here the day, uh, I want to uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for this opportunity, David. I, I just wanted to also add that we uh, donate part of our sales to prostate cancer foundations as well. So we support prostate cancer and spinal cord injury uh, uh, research. So we are a urology company. So we are part of the field of urology and we want uh, to advance the field of neurourology with the help of urologists and academic centers.